Welcome back to A Closer Look with Mark Miller and Mark Shine. We were away last week. We hope you had a great Christmas, and we'd like to wish you a Happy New Year. Mark, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas? I had uh, a good chance to go to church, faiths involved, family and food. The presents are all secondary. It was a great time. How about it you? It was. I, I did the same. Lots of family in and out of town. Uh, lots of food and OD'd on football. There I'm you ready go. to get back to basketball. I'm ready with you. And we missed some games. They were, yes, we they were a lot of playing over the holidays. We want to catch you and us up a little bit on some of the great games that occurred. Mark, you're going to start off. Yeah, the Assets Allocation Tournament down in, uh, in Coldwater. It was a great tournament. St. Henry and Coldwater match up on the semifinals on the first night. St. Henry wins 57-52. Schleimann with 26. Lutmer with 10. Typical for Coldwater, they had uh, five, six players in between 5 and 12 points. Been very balanced this year, had the Coldwater Cavaliers. Marion Local won the second game over Salina, 62-47. So in the consolation game, Coldwater 62, Salina 52. Again, uh, five Coldwater players between the 7 and 17 points. Albers led them with 17. But Marion Local won the championship game over St. Henry, 52-42. Mesher with 15. Pringer and Colleague with 12. Runs with 11. This is the second time that Marion Local has defeated St. Henry this year, once in MAC play, and now wants to win the tournament. Hey, let's look at the Bluffton Holiday Tournament. Bluffton won their tournament in the semis. Allen East beat Arlington 59-55, and Bluffton took care of Corey Ross in 62-39. Then on the second night in the consolation game, Arlington come out of there with a 3-4 and four record. They beat Corey Rawson, who ends up at 3-6. and six. And in the championship game, Bluffton 66, Allen East 52. That puts Bluffton even up at 3-3. Three three. Allen East, that's just their second loss at 5-2. The all-tourney team, Eric Ritter from Corey Rawson, Logan Spire, that's a name that keeps coming back oh, yeah. around, doesn't it? From Arlington, Caleb Smelser and Spencer Miller, two football names that we talked a lot about in the fall from Allen East. And two guys, the brothers, Gabe and Luke Deniker from Bluffton, the tourney MVP, also from, from Bluffton, Zane Meyer, he had 22 points in the championship game. Hey, watch out for Luke Deniker. That freshman can flat out play. He is a very good player to watch as we go through things. Well, let's look at a couple teams then, Mark, that have finished undefeated uh, in through the first part of the season, at least the 2016 part. Let's start with the Ottawa Glendorf Titans. They're 7-0, 1-0. Over the break, they defeated Bowling Green 86-63. Then they won at Archibald 68-60. Dybul and Schrader with 18 apiece. Schrader had five threes. Kaufman with 16 that night. Then it went over Perrysburg, who's 5-3 right now. That was a 56-51 win. Kaufman once again led him in scoring with 16. Dybul with 14. White with 10. Schrader made a couple of threes. The Titans are on a roll right now, heading into Western Buckeye League play. Also on a roll, Van Buren, 6-0, 3-0 in the BVC right there. They are coached by Mark Bishop. We talked about him in a Where Are They Now segment not too long ago. They're winning their games by an average of 17 points a game, led by Braxton Fasoni at 16.3 and Matthew Ayers at 11.8. You see that 3-0 in the BBC. There are also four other teams undefeated in league play, but none of them undefeated overall like Van Buren. As many people expected, the Wayne Trace Raiders are now 7-0. I got through that without spitting over it too much. All right, they've beaten Van Wert 65-56, Miller City 72-53, and Woodland, Indiana 82-57. Of course, they're led in scoring by Ethan Linder, the University of Finley uh, recruit, and he's having a great year, as are the Raiders. And Fort Laramie's 8-0. They're also 5-0 in the SCAL. They won last night on Monday night, the second, over New Bremen 52-35. we got more coming up with the Redskins later on in the show. That's right. Let's look at some individual uh, landmarks that were reached over the holidays. A couple of guys hit their 1,000 point. Jacoby Lane Harvey from Perry on December 20th, went over 1,000 at Shawnee, and Derek Jay from St. Mary's on December 27th at Lipsick, and Lipsick stopped the game and honored Derek. Mark, you got a little bit more information on that. Yeah, that was really cool because I know uh, Derek's family wrote a letter to the editor and how, just how pleased they were with the support from Lipsick. I thought it was a very classy thing, first off, for Lipsick to do, and second, for the family to thank Lipsick for doing that publicly. That was really cool, too. Yeah, well, a good kid there. Both yes, those sir. guys are good kids. Uh, also, a career three leader now. Derek has made more three-point goals than anybody else in St. Mary's history. Let's look at Mason Baxter, also from Parkway. Now, his team starts one and four, and during that time, he's averaging just 12 points a game. In those first five games, he made nine three-point field goals, but Mason Baxter, his team from Parkway, has won two out of the last three. The loss was a double overtime loss to Maumee Valley Country Day. In those three games, Mason averages 18.3, made 14 three-point field goals in those three games. Parkway's going to be a little bit of a force to reckon with in the MAC through the rest of the year. Well, we talked about Derek J being the three-point uh, three shot leader in the career at uh, St. Mary's. We've got a, guy, a bunch of guys for Temple 
that might be trying to set a record as a team. They have 50 made threes in just seven games. Seth Holbein has 24. Noah Howell has 19 and Brody Bowman seven for Temple. Bruce Bowman there at three and four, but if you can hit the outside three like they can, they're dangerous every single night. And we were concerned with Lincoln View. They graduated so many players from a year ago. How are they going to match up? Well, they got a big win on, De on December 29th over Kaleida, 51-48. In that game, Overholt had 23 out of their 51 points, made five three-point field goals. Lincoln View got a win. That takes them to three and four. They are 0-1 in league play, however, and got to get it going there as soon as we get in the second part of the season. All right, we take broadcaster shine and make him coach shine here, and yep. we talk about rules, and you got something here, a play of the week, uh, goaltending. Yeah, let's look at a play of the week in goaltending, and, and this is in a very critical part of the LCC Shawnee game. You can see right here that uh, Shawnee is down by three, and we have Tyler Moore goes to the basket in transition. This would have cut the lead to one, but as we watch it again, Here's the move, the ball gets up, it's on the rim, and Ray Manley comes in and touches the ball while it's still in the cylinder. Rulebook says if any part of the ball is in the cylinder, an offensive player or defensive player cannot touch it. Here's the third look at it. We see our official Ben Kramer makes the call right away. There you can see the ball still in the rim, in the ring, and the cylinder, of course, goes all the way to the ceiling with that, and that takes away an important two points, but the correct call right there, offensive goaltending against Ray Manley. That was never a problem with me. No, I didn't Gold have to worry about that either. I didn't have to worry about the nine-foot baskets. <laughs> hey, in our Where Are They Now segment, we're going to look at Brandon Pardon from Lincoln View. In 1996, Brandon was on the team that ended up as Division IV state runner-up. He was second team All-State that year, averaged 19 points a game. The following year was the dream season over there in Lincoln View. The 97 state champions, 27-0, coached by Dave Evans, the current athletic director at Elida. He was the Ohio Player of the Year in Division IV, averaged 21.3 points, made 84 threes. Then he went to Wright State for a year, and then he saw the light. Went up north to Bowling Green State University, was there from 98 through 2002, and as a junior and senior, averaged just over 10 points a game and just under seven assists per game. He led the MAC Conference in assists both his junior and senior years. Went to Europe and played in France in 0203 in Austria 0304 and now lives in Fort Wayne with his right wife Johanna two boys one girl he sells surgical equipment we did I think all of their tournament games that year many of their regular season games got to know that get that kid and that team very well that was one player and one great team. You know, the thing I remember most about him, if you think back, was his junior year. We had that eye injury mm -hmm. in the state tournament, tried to play with goggles on. His team didn't win the tournament that year, probably because of that plus the injury to West Dudgeon. But then they came back as seniors. What a great finish that was for him. The thing I remember about Brandon is he played at breakneck speed yeah. every single minute. When he got the ball, it didn't matter if it was inbounds or rebound. It was a fast break. Yeah, he could call. really hit. Yes, it was. All right, Coach Shine, let's, right. let's look at a rule now. We're going yep. to talk about jersey numbers. Well, here's what happened. We actually got a letter. We've had two letters this year. Right. The letter wanted to know, he, a, a reviewer said, you know what, when I played, you wore odd-numbered uniforms away and even-numbered uniforms at home. When did that change? So we did a little bit of research, and actually, we could not actually find it ever being a rule. We talked to, to a couple of officials. We looked online read online that it was actually a preferred practice and not a rule and it gradually went away at the end of the 1980s into the 1990s where now you can have either number odd or even on your home and away jersey so most players have just a single number so that led to well what about numbers where are the rules well first of all they have to be shown on a single hand so you can only have obviously numbers zero through five so you can show the numbers on one hand whether it's a 12 you make it a one two or that type of situation so it has to be shown on one hand. The other thing is you could not use one or two for a long time. And the reason was officials were told to, when a free throw was made, you hold up one finger. When a field goal was made, you hold up two fingers. And to avoid confusion, you were not allowed to use the numbers one and two. Well, that rule is gone. Officials no longer single signal a single point or a double point. So you don't have to worry about it. The three-point field goal, of course, is raised over your hand, so you could use the three. And so that rule doesn't exist now. You can have any number between 0 and 55. The only real rule is you cannot have both a 0 and a double 0 on the same team. And they have to be Arabic numerals. No Roman numerals. Wouldn't you like to see the backwood <laughs> togas come out with XXIV on the back of a guy's shirt? Well, sorry, you can't do it. It has to be done in, in Arabic numerals. And the, 
Now, it used to be a, a violation was a technical file for each in violation of the scorebook. Now it's just a single violation. Uh, one single technical file changes them all. And something we believe in, head coaches, athletic directors, make the numbers visible from the crowd and from the press yeah. row area, yeah. please. No dark gray on no, black uniforms. Yeah, that's right. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> your number, make your rosters in numerical order and not alphabetical and not by grade. Numerical order helps us all out. It a just makes bit. it easy on us. It does. What number were you? Well, I was actually I was a 42-43 in yep. high school and a 32-33 yep. in college. So go. back yep. in the old days. I was 12-13. There you yeah, go. I had to find all a skinny right. one for me. <laughs> all right. Hey, uh, for our bright spot tonight, yep. Fort Loramie and St. Henry over the holidays did some pretty cool stuff. Mark Shine, you got well, the details. On December 20th, this is the third year now, Fort Loramie and St. Henry played a boys' basketball game, and Fort, Fort Loramie won a basketball game. But that's not the important thing is. The important thing is they asked fans to bring toys to the game. They collected more than 600 toys. This you can see here, the pictures of the seniors from Fort Loramie. They then took the toys down to Dayton Children's Hospital and delivered them pre-Christmas. In the picture, we see the seniors, Jarrett Meyer, Cody Barhorst, Nate Plyman, Austin Siegel, Evan Burning, Dylan Braun, and Tyler Siegel. They, and along with their coach, took these toys down to Dayton Children's Hospital and made Christmas for a good thing for a lot of young people down in the hospital at a tough time to be in the hospital, of course, at Christmas time. We really salute the St. Henry and the Fort Laramie communities for putting that together for the third year in a row. Yep. Good job, guys. That's awesome. Yep. Hey, a lot of coaches say that it's two seasons, one before Chris, the holidays and one after the holidays. So we want to give you a glimpse of the league races for that first season and bring it up to date. So, Mark, you're going to start with the Mac. Well, I do. And first of all, if I could lobby for something, I wish there was a way to start all the league races after the first of the year. You know, I, I just think that maybe you have to play a double weekend in there somewhere. For example, we're going to start with the Mac here. And, and obviously, you've got nine games you have to play in that league. So you have to double up somewhere. But it, I think it would make a great break to be able to do that. Versailles is 2-0. and Justin Arns, of course, uh, the, the Ohio State recruits, having a great year. So is his brother, AJ. Seven different players have made threes. Their only loss is to Dayton Dunbar by nine. They have a really interesting schedule coming up between January 10th and January 20th. They play that undefeated Fort Laramie team. Then they play Marion Local at home, and you can see where the Flyers are at in conference play right now. Then Tri-Village, who's three and four, but they had some suspended players who will be back by that point in time. And Tri-Village, always one of the better teams around. And then Fort Recovery, and you can see where they're at right here. Fort Recovery is four and one. They uh, did beat Delphi St. John's in overtime. 56-55. Uh, Micah Cox leads them in scores. Nine different players have made a three-point field goal for Fort Recovery. Minster's hanging in there. New Knoxville's hanging in there. Interesting Mac coming up in the second part of the season. The Western Buckeye League. There are only one league game in, so the overall record's a better glimpse at what we got going on. 7-0 Ottawa Glendorf. No surprise there. Wapakoneta 7-1. That might surprise some people. They're playing extremely well. Next on the list, Van Wert. They've gotten hot lately here. Won a couple of games. Elida 4-3 overall. And all three of those losses, they've been ahead in the fourth quarter. Defiance, you never have to can count them out. And Shawnee, off to that good start, has stumbled here a little bit lately. They started off 5-0. and But uh, that, that uh, will be a great race, but I think everybody's still chasing OG. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's size they've got inside. It's a little bit different OG team, big and strong inside. Let's move on to the Northwest Conference. Spencerville is 6-1. They're 1-0 in conference play with a win over Lincoln View. Gary Shrelucky is their three-point shooter. Dakota Pritchard does a little bit of everything. Averages 18 points a game. Griffin and Bailey Croft give them size inside. Crestview's four and two. They've got a win over Columbus Grove in conference play. Derek Stout averages 16 a game. Javen Etzler, 15.3. Drew Klein, one of my favorite players. One of those guys who doesn't have to score to affect the game. Point guard, distributes the ball, solid defense, great leader. Allen East is 5-2. and two. They haven't played a conference game yet, so we're not quite sure where they're going to be. And, of course, Bluffton won the McDonald's tournament, so that obviously propels them into the second part of the season. Next, we're going to look at the NWCC, uh, the team that a lot of uh, people, including ourselves, talked about preseason, Perry. Now, that's 4-3 and three overall, but they've played a very difficult schedule. All three of those losses in the WBL? All three WBL correct? schools, okay. yep. Temple Christian, we talked about their outside shooting prowess, and then you can see Upper Scioto Valley. They will be right there at the end. You can count on it. an early season loss to a good team and a 5-3 and three record overall. So, again, Perry being chased, Upper Scioto Valley will figure in. Let's put up the Putnam County League as well. This is one of my favorite conferences year in and year out. I just love that league. They've won 56.5% of their non-league games, so we've got some really strong schools going right now. PG's come back for Joe Bradick. 
in his first year coaching there. They're 3-1, and 2-0. and oh. Got a couple of wins up already. Johnson leads them in scoring at 20.8. Cooper McCullough is their three-point shooter, and they're giving up just 41 points a game defensively. Ottoville's come back with a good year so far. They're 6-2. and two. Uh, they have wins over Crestview and Lincoln View. Logan Kemper and Nicholas Mormon both averaging over 20 a game. Miller City, we saw them play. They're a really fine basketball team. Five and two. Their losses are to undefeated Van Buren, undefeated Wayne Trace. They're playing well right now. They've got Miller City coming up with uh, Port, Put, uh, PG, Miller City Continental coming up this weekend. We get to do that game. A lot of stuff going on right now in that conference. I love the PCL. BVC, there are five teams that are undefeated. And Van Buren 6-0, Hopewell Loudon 7-1, obviously off to great starts. As Mark mentioned, Friday, 3-0 Van Buren at 3-0 Liberty Benton. We will be there to do the game and along with us for the third year in a row, Jerry Snodgrass, OHSAA Assistant Commissioner, and our former broadcast partner will join us in the booth and we will talk about OHSAA happenings, get his expertise on the game, and enjoy what should be a great game in that part of the First state. First of all, it's a great basketball game between two teams that are going to be at the top of their conference. But second, we get to add Jerry and get yep. his insight. A lot of things are going on with the OHSAA right now. Yep. That's a really good weekend coming up for us. That'll be a lot of fun. Let's yep. throw up the games that we will have on our broadcast schedule this week. And uh, we are back into it hot and heavy, as you can imagine, all the way through the state tournament. Pick a game. Get out to the game, come home, watch it afterwards. We'd love to see you here again next week. Thank you for joining us. It's been a closer look with Mark and Mark.